Wasatch County Sheriff Jared Rigby is accused of bullying an officer who reported his police chief for excessive use of force. He has threatened our whole department. Well, because Lucas, it really comes down to the future, your future in the police department. The video of him intimidating the, the officer was sickening. Nobody's above the law. In March 2021, Officer Lucas McTaggart thought he was responding to a routine drunk and disorderly call. He was training a new member of the force, and most of his attention was given to making sure he was clear on what was the correct procedure for the situation. The suspect resisted, which wasn't unusual for his level of intoxication. So at first, McTaggart wasn't concerned. After all, other experienced officers were on the scene, including Chief Dave Booth. As the suspect continued to resist, McTaggart was shocked to see Booth's hand on their throat, since this went directly against department policy. It was also concerning since Booth was a superior officer, and it could damage McTaggart's career if he said anything. Still, he believed excessive force was used and made a report. This led to an investigation, where McTaggart was made to feel as if he were the one who had done something wrong. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. So it's September 1st, 2021, about 7.10 in the morning. So what we want to do is provide you some intro okay. to what it is we're doing, ask some questions, uh, and you're welcome to ask questions throughout. Um, ultimately, we want to talk about uh, a written statement as well. That's kind of overall the big picture okay. of what we're here to do. So we're doing an internal affairs investigation for Heber City Police Department. Okay. Um, I've been asked by the mayor to do that. Um, this has to do with the Jesse Rodriguez incident on March 31st, mm -hmm. 2021. And as part of that, I think we're all on the same page, but just to make sure, there was already a criminal investigation of this. Mm -hmm. So there, there are actually two. <clears throat> so one focused on Jesse James Rodriguez, mm -hmm. and the other one focused on whether there were criminal violations of excessive use of force. And so the the Rodriguez one is still ongoing in court, and the other one is that there's no criminal charges pertaining to officers. So, um, when it comes to this interview and us doing, I mean, whether it's an IA or you want to call it an administrative review or whatever it is, it's the same thing. So, um, This isn't a Garrity interview. Okay. okay. So, um, Garrity interviews, generally speaking, are meant when there are criminal charges that could potentially be on the table, mm -hmm. or at least an investigation is ongoing or could be ongoing. An or, actually it could be an and or, but, um, there's concerns about a person's uh, propensity to tell the truth. So there's some question as to whether they're making inconsistent statements or false statements. And if that was the case, then Garrity can be given to make it perfectly clear that there is uh, an obligation on the employee's part to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, kind of an idea. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so Garrity provides protections to an employee, like in your spot, having to do with potential criminal investigation. Doesn't say crimes can't be brought if Garrity is given, but instead is saying anything that we were to talk about here cannot be shared with criminal investigators. Well, there's already been a criminal investigation conducted. We know there's 
no crimes that are going to come of that. And so at least that piece is not on the table, and so we won't do it. If we were concerned about your ability to tell the truth or we questioned any of those things, then we would also consider giving Garrity. We're not in that boat. So you're not in trouble. Rigby assures McTaggart that he isn't in trouble, which is odd because McTaggart is the one calling out an issue, and he knows he is not the subject of the investigation. Um, I don't anticipate anything here causing you some kind of a disciplinary. Um, I know lots of times officers get concerned about the consequences of what they say, meaning how that affects them with their coworkers. Um, and I, I do get that kind of the informal um, kind of between officers, crews, supervisors, um, are they going to be upset with me? Any of those kinds of things. Um, so, it's not a criminal investigation. It's not a Garrity interview. At least at this point, we have no reason to do that. Um, with that said, there's always the expectation when you're, when an employee is meeting with their employer, or here we are in place of your employer, to tell the truth and the whole truth and not exaggerate and not leave anything out and, and not embellish anything. So we don't need Garrity for that. Um, an employee can be disciplined uh, just because they're not telling the truth and it can be corroborated other ways without Garrity. Um, another piece to all of that is uh, that if we felt like we needed to stop the interview, uh, do a Garrity interview, and we, we, we'd do that. We'd stop, we'd just restart, and we'd give Garrity admonitions. Hey, these are the warnings and admonitions. These are your rights under it as well. Um, do you have any questions so far? I'm sure they'll be answered. So, um, <clears throat> we don't want you to question um, the, the credibility or the authenticity of us talking to you. So, if you want to be calling Jim Moore at this point in time to make sure that all this is really legit and and that we're asking questions on behalf of Heber City Police Department. We can do that. That's not necessary. Okay. So, really, the interview is meant to kind of have an introduction, get it out, out on the table, and then for us to ask some questions that are pretty specific. So we, we've already seen the body cam that people have. We've seen the reports, um, also the DPS interviews. So all that's in our minds. So lots of times in an interview we'll say, so start from the beginning and tell us about this thing. And that's just not what we, where we're at with this at this point in time. It's just kind of a, a waste of, of your time. And so we're just going to start into some questions that are really kind of having to do with one part of the overall incident. Rigby should be trying to get as much information as possible instead of cutting out large portions of the story. This is especially true, given that he is friends with the accused and should not be in charge of the investigation at all. I recently released another highly intense video on my Patreon an explosive altercation between two cops where tension escalated so quickly, resulting in a drawn gun and a devastating gunshot. In a mere 26 seconds, witness the events unfold as two officers engage in a fight that turns deadly. Watch this video and more at patreon.com slash strangerstoriesplus. 
and it's not even anything having to do with being in the house and being with Jesse James Rodriguez and then moving on to the gurney and then going to the, to the cage and all that kind of stuff. So I don't think you need to feel like we're, we don't have that as the basis because we've been over all of that. And if we were to just go over it here, um, it just is kind of needless because we're really focused on, on the questions that we have and uh, we just don't want to waste your time and having you think, uh, is it having to do with all this kind of stuff? It's like we can tell where there's policy concerns in these areas. And, okay. That kind of thing. Any questions so far? We don't want to take time out of your CIT training, so that's why we're going to cut right Super. straight to the meat of the subject. It's very kind of you. You're welcome. It's very You're welcome. kind of you. <laughs> All right. So, when it comes to how all of the concern came about, um, our concern has to do with inconsistent and false statements, not on your part. And so um, the first question really that we have is we know that you're the FTO to Adrian Gonorrhea on this call, March 31st, 2021, right? Mm -hmm. Liberty Station, Jesse Rodriguez. And then from there, there end up being concerns in the police department about how it was handled, specifically um, whether there was excessive use of force. And even more specifically, whether Dave Booth used any excessive use of force. So what do you know or what was your involvement in after March 31st and that incident, and then discussion with others. I'm leaving the others open at this point in time. We can narrow down more on officers, supervisors, uh, spouse, people outside the office, but all of that's on the table right now. What was your discussion about the incident with others, generally speaking? Um been a while so I don't 100% recall timing on everything or anything like that but I know I discussed with I think three other officers and I discussed with a supervisor okay, is the is the supervisor one of the three officers or separate separate Okay, um, can you tell us more about the officers and the supervisor? What, what are you looking for? Names, times, um, best to your recollection. I believe I told, talked about it with Rojo, Richard, and I actually want to say Weisher, but that was kind of random because he was just in the office randomly. And that would have been like I said, I don't remember time frames, but it would have been shortly after the incident, like within a couple days. So accurate to say shortly after incident, within a couple days. Okay. And the supervisor? Jarvie. Okay, and what were the circumstances there? My discussion with my supervisor? Uh -huh. I was doing what I was obligated to do by policy based on what I had seen. So help us understand the circumstances of how that conversation happened. So where were you, kind of the time frame that it happened? In his office. Um, time frame still shortly after, but it was after I spoke to the other officers. So within days. McTaggart was shocked over what he had seen and wanted to ensure he wasn't misinterpreting what had happened. Shortly after the incident, within days after the incident, 
but also it's after you spoke with these three. That's how I recall that it was after that I would have talked to them. It was time for me to look into what I felt like I needed to do. Okay. Okay. And so, um, is this on a, were you both working? I think so. I don't see why I would have been in there otherwise. So we won't be strong there, but you think you were both working. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and we were, it was just him and I on a crew at that point, so. Who okay. was on your crew at that time? Well, that's, I was FTOing Adrian. Uh, so it was just me, it was just me and Jarvie, and then I was training Adrian. So just the three of you on that crew, on Jarvie's crew? Mm-hmm. Okay. At that point, you're the only two on the crew, and he is your crew supervisor. Yes. Okay. And this happened in Sergeant Jarvie's office. Is it day crew, or sorry, is it day shift or night shift? I don't remember. I could look back. That's right around shift change time. So we started in January on days. Would have been three months, so right around the end of March, beginning of April would have been the switch. So yeah. I, don't, I don't remember. So you think this was in a within a few days of March thirty first. But we also want to be careful not to make it too much. So fairness wise, you think it was for sure within a week? You think it for sure was within two weeks? Like maybe three Three weeks? I mean, I think within a week. Okay. I, it's hard for me to say for sure because it's been a long time. But pretty confident. I, I, yes, because I was, you know, I. It wasn't anything that I sat on for any period of time. I. It happened. I did my research, talked about it a little bit, and you know, determined what I thought I needed to do with it, and did that. Okay. Pretty confident in the conversation with Jeremy occurred within one week of March 31st. Okay. Okay. Um, how long was the conversation? Couldn't tell you. I mean, it was... It was not super brief. I mean, we sat and chatted for a while, but okay. I don't even know that it was all entirely just on that subject. Others present besides the two of you? No. Um, Adrian may have been out doing paperwork in the office while the door was closed. Okay. I don't. Door was closed. If, if he was in the office, the door would have been closed. It wasn't a conversation I would have had for other people to hear. Did you consider it a formal conversation? Yes. And why would you consider a formal conversation? Well, or kind of the outward, or what was said not not necessarily there? a formal conversation. Where it's it's with my supervisor who I can talk with comfortably. This is more of a formal conversation than that, but sure. formal because it was me doing what I had determined I was required to do by policy. And I made that clear in the, in the conversation. I did my research. I looked into law and policy and I determined I was required by Heber city policy to report what I had seen to my supervisor. And so I made it clear, this is me reporting it to my supervisor. Okay. And he was clear on that also. Okay. During this conversation, from the way you, when you spoke with Sergeant Jarvie, um, was this the first, from your, from your understanding, was this the first that he had heard of this? From my understanding, yes. Okay, from the way he acted, from, the, from his reaction, from you telling him about this incident, it was the first time he had heard about it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Not about the entire incident, obviously. No, or the entire not call, about the entire but, incident, but from what you were right. bringing forward to him. Right, right. Okay. Yes. So what were the concerns that you raised? That I observed an officer use excessive force. Or 
what I perceived to be excessive force from where I saw it happen. Okay. And so you're concerned about Dave Booth using excessive force. Correct. And you communicated that to Sergeant Jarvie. I did. What was, at what point do you think that Dave Booth used excessive force? When he put his hand on Jesse's neck and squeezed his neck to put him into the, into the back of, I believe it was Adrian's car, but that patrol car. So, to say it accurately, when, when he recovered, he knew that the recording was going, okay. When he put his hand on Jesse's neck and squeezed, is that accurate? Yes. And put him inside the car. Is that fair to... Inaccurate to say it that way? Yes. Put him inside the patrol vehicle. Okay. Were there any other concerns that you had about excessive use of force? No. Anything else? Any other concerns that you raised at the time with Sergeant Jarvie having to do with the incident? Uh, only how to deal with that excuse me, how to have that conversation with somebody that I was training to be a new officer who I thought witnessed it because it was just the three of us there. And everybody else was kind of milling around scene. I'm, as you know, there's a lot of people on scene at that point, just the way it, the, the previous use of force with Jesse had gone down and the emergency button and everything. Mm -hmm. But to, to my recollection and my perception was at that moment, it was Jesse, Chief, Adrian, and me and kind of our own little little world and okay. and so that that was i mean honestly that was the the most upsetting thing to me about it at the time was that i was going to have to reconcile that with somebody who i was trying to teach how to be a cop so most upsetting since you were the fto and you were training new officer and it was your job to reconcile what do you mean when you say reconcile I just I just didn't know how to to approach it with him but do, you know do I obviously a difficult situation where it's chief if it was another line level officer yeah like Hey, this is cut and dry. What what you saw happen there was wrong and not the way we do things, and that'll be dealt with, but you don't need to worry about that, but we need to have that conversation. That's, and that's just a little bit more of a difficult conversation so, with a with somebody who's I mean, it was a difficult situation for me to be in and I'm experienced and I have no issue being on a scene with chief and you know and all of that stuff, and then imagine that from a brand new guy still in training who turns out was having a very hard time in training. Yeah. So, what makes you think, though, that... Rigby begins to gaslight McTaggart by implying that what he perceived isn't actually what happened. Before we move forward, I want to extend my thanks for watching. This video today has no sponsor, so if you're enjoying it, subscribing helps the channel grow. You can also check out my second channel, Stranger Crimes, after this video. The way you perceive it is the way that it is. So, what I mean by that is... You're seeing excessive use of force. That's not your decision. That is a determination that the department will make. Sure. And so I, I like and I appreciate and I respect you going through the process. Hey, I have a concern. You raise it to your sergeant. That's the right thing to do. And, and maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying here, but the way that it's coming across to me, at least at this point, is that you're feeling like you have to explain 
to the new employee, the, the chief just used excessive use of force, and now we got to work through that. Am I, am I misunderstanding that? You're not. The way, the way that I perceived that, there, it was pretty cut and dry from what I perceived. I, I, you know, I was right there with it, and I, I didn't see anything, especially with we've just been told chokeholds are against policy and all, you know, George Floyd and everything else and people going to prison and, and all of this stuff. And then we see that happen. And that was very clear to me that that was inappropriate. So in one way or the other, maybe not. And I, maybe this is what you're getting at. You know, I'm not saying that, yeah, he committed a crime at that point. What's a chokehold mean? Anything applying pressure to the neck. I mean, they're saying, George Floyd, they're relating that to a chokehold, and he had a knee on the back of his neck, and you can't stop breathing from the back of the neck. So I mean, what... Is that what your policy talks about with chokehold? Is anything that applies pressure to the neck? Um, I don't know, honestly. I don't know off the top of my head right now. But so, oh, that, in that... And to back up, that wasn't anything on the back of the neck. I mean, that was... I watched his hands squeeze around the front of his neck. How long do you think that lasted for? I have thought about that because my other concern when I researched what my obligation was is, you know, coming across the duty to intervene. And so I, you know, I had a second to myself to should I have stepped in and grabbed Chief's arm and said, hey, quit. Um, I think by time everything processed what was happening, it was done. So I think, and I never saw the video, so I never saw it besides in that moment. But I, so you've only, this is just your recollection from I, your eyewitness account. Yep. You've never reviewed or watched a video since that? Not of that, not of that part, no. Okay. I've seen video of us fighting with Jesse, but no, not of that part. Okay. Um, so but I, I, you know, and I'm sorry, maybe I was in the middle of the statement. When... So overall, I think whether it's now or sometime in our interview here, it, I think it's it's good and it's fine to be talking about whether there's excessive use of force and and chokehold and applying pressure and all those kinds of things. So um, I think that's good. I think that's healthy. We are here representing uh, your department and uh, and also their views when it comes to their policy. I mean that's what we're doing. We're doing an IA, so it's built mm -hmm. on policy. And I'm sure there'll be things to come as far as training. But the bottom line is, is for right now, um, is, it, is it accurate for us to say that at least at that point in time, you felt like you were going to have to reconcile this with the new officer and saying uh, that the chief, what the chief's doing there, you, you can't do that. Yeah, that was a concern. All right, so or and maybe I should say uh, that was a concern of whether I should do that that specifically with him or or not mm -hmm. or how to, how to, how to approach that was was my biggest concern is how how to deal with that as his trainer. Okay. Okay. And so, being the representative of the police department at this point in time, um, I guess the communication is um, that takes at least part of that off of your shoulders is really it's it's a determination that the process needs to follow, right? So if if through the process it was determined that it's excessive use of force, then you're going to be in that boat. I understand that, but. That, that's also not valid because if the law is going to sit and say that an officer is legally required to intervene when there's excessive force being used, that's an in-the-moment thing, right? Mm -hmm. So how do I intervene on something that has to be determined by this later process? But you didn't intervene. No, no, no. I didn't. So but you I'm don't just... need to get with the officer. If you didn't intervene, then why would you need to get with the officer and tell him? Because the reason I didn't intervene is because there was not time for me to intervene, because it was done. 
Okay. So what was my perspective of it? And like I said, I had that thought afterwards, should I, have, should I have intervened? And I realized, you know, this is something that happened so quickly that by the time I processed everything, so it wasn't you, something for, if that had you, gone on, it would have been something for me to have intervened. Did you in. end up having a conversation with Adrian about it? A, a very non-specific conversation. Okay. So Lucas, help us understand. So you're really concerned about the spot it puts you in because you're going to have to reconcile this with the officer, but you didn't reconcile it with the officer. Well, I, that was, that was my concern immediately on, you know, did, well, one, did he see what I, did Adrian see what I saw? Is he processing what I'm processing, which mm -hmm. I don't His know. His perspective, is it the same or different? Yeah, I don't, I, I, to this day do not know. Um, and I, so, I mean, in that conversation with Jarvi that I had, I also had this conversation about how to approach it with Adrian. And, you know, we kind of determined it was best to have a more broad conversation of there's kind of an old way of doing things and a new way of doing things and we can't do things like they used to do things and, and kind of just one of those conversations. It was, so, it was never, it was never, I never specifically sat him down and said, did you see chief do this? Or I saw chief do this and you know, don't do that. And, and that it was never specifically <coughs> discussed with Adrian like that. So did Adrian ever bring up the issue of any type of misdoing by anyone during the time that uh, Jesse was put into the car? No. So he never did come to you and say, listen, I'm concerned or during this conversation that you had of old school, new school. This answer does not work in McTaggart's favor since it sounds like he may have been the only one who thought both used excessive force. There was nothing brought up by Adrian as far as any concerns. No, but he wasn't really one to bring stuff up. He was kind of just doing this for the whole time. Okay. okay. Through FTO, I mean. No, I get you. Or his, his part of it, too. Okay. All right. So. So, and. And maybe I'm not. I don't know. Maybe I'm not communicating it well. I, you know, I, I take pride in training new officers and my, in that position and the importance of that position. And so that, I guess that was a, that was. You know, me having Adrian there was was just something else onto that issue. That issue would have been that issue with with just me there. And she, you know, I saw what I saw independent of Adrian. And then on top of all of that, on what I was, you know, figuring out what I needed to do, what our policy said, what the law said, I had the thought Adrian was there too and was in a position where he could have saw exactly what I saw. So how do you know, do I need to have that conversation with him and how specifically do I need to have that conversation with him? So when did you have the conversation with Adrian? Um, either that day that I talked to Jarvie or the next, within the next shift or two, quickly after. Within day or two. Of speaking with Jarvie. And so you'd said above that you're pretty confident that you met with Jarvie within a few days, for sure a week of March 31st. So this is still kind of within the first week or two. Would that be accurate to say? Mm -hmm. So within two weeks after March 31st. Okay. Where did the conversation with Adrian happen? I don't remember. Either in a patrol car or in our office. And was it more of a kind of a formal conversation where it's just kind of you and him? It's not like at break and then it kind of comes up or help us understand this? It story. was It was just me and him, but it's, I mean... One of those FTO conversations that we have all the time. Yeah, could it, be you know, So, I mean, we were having those con conversations consistently. So it wasn't, I'm sure it wasn't anything. It was just another learning moment from his perspective. Well, and when you were doing it, were you talking specifically about the March 31st 
first Jesse James Rodriguez that season? I'm sure I was. I can't, I, you know, I don't remember the exact conversation I had with Adrian, but we did have a lot of conversation about that just because he was involved in a use of force with Jesse. And so there, there was a lot. And if I remember right, that was like his first day of FT. Um, so there, there was a lot of conversation surrounding all of that incident that had taken place and, and took place for a while. So were there any other parts of that incident that you considered to be old school versus there's a different way of doing it now? No. So just that piece, Dave Booth, his hand on Jesse's neck, squeezing. I mean, I, the old school thing is just kind of how it was, I came up with to, to maybe have that conversation. I mean, that's excessive force isn't old school. It happens. So I, I don't know. I don't want to label it as that was being old school. I'm sure that happens, you know, in so, policing right now. So, I, so overall, I guess my point, just to be clear about it, is um, on behalf of the police department, I don't. They don't see that as a conversation for an FTO to have with their new officer in making a determination that that wasn't the way to do it. Um, something, I mean, that can work for other things, but not for something like this. Because if you're going to go and talk with your sergeant because you're getting it off your shoulders, this is something that's important. Rigby is wrong. It is McTaggart's job to point out any action that goes against policy to the officer he is training. Otherwise, he sets a precedent for not speaking out. And policy requires that I go and do this thing. There's a process for figuring that out. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't sit with an officer and it doesn't sit with a sergeant. And it goes up like it did. Mm -hmm. And ultimately it goes to the chief's supervisor. Mm -hmm. And then there's a criminal investigation on it. And then the decision on that. And then there's an IA that's done on it. And then there's a decision on that. And what has been done, or at least it somewhat looks like it's been done, is, well, Adrian's already been told that that was not the way to be doing it. Although it wasn't specific, it was just generalized that that wasn't the way to be doing things. So I don't know if that's, uh, if you agree with it, but that is the police department's view on that issue. And so from here, you could probably have more conversation with supervisors um, and hear it straight from them um, and be like, oh, okay, I, I guess maybe next time I should do it differently or maybe they want me to tweak it just some and maybe I can keep part of what I did. Um, any questions about that? It's not that you have to agree. It's no, I, it is. It, I understand what you're saying. <clears throat> I, I just... I guess questions on where that's coming from because I feel like you're obviously already prepared with that information you just gave me, right? That, What's that? That whole that whole speech just barely that you just gave me about how I handled it and that my department thinks it's wrong. I mean, so, I'm assuming that that sounds like it was something that came from no, you before the conversation no, no, that we just had. No, that is me hearing this for the first time. Okay. And applying what I know. Okay. And then me going back to them and saying. This is the statement I made on your, on your behalf. Okay. That's what it is. And okay. then they'll honor it. Sure. Because that's what we're doing here, is that we're doing this on their behalf. So. Well, they, that, then maybe it, I mean, maybe it needs to be more clear that I, I in no way threw chief under the bus to Adrian. I mean, that was, that was why I made it a point to do that, is how do I, that was me. trying to have a conversation on, I guess, appropriate use of force or whatever that, that may be without throwing chief under the bus, knowing, okay. you know, having seen what I'd seen. Okay. I had zero intent and I, and I don't believe that I did. Obviously that's up to Adrian's perspective of the conversation that I had with him. So I can't speak for that, mm -hmm. but I had absolutely no intent to, to You're even, trying to be careful to, with that part. Yeah. That, that's why it was difficult. It was a hard, but still thing. trying to 
do this conversation and, and talk and teach and mentor and right. move forward. Right. Okay, got it. I'll make sure that that part's in there. So you didn't mention the chief at all because you said you didn't get specific? I, I don't know whether I, I mentioned chief or if I... If, if I did mention Chief, I didn't mention Chief, hey, he did something wrong. I definitely didn't ever bring up anything like this. You know, I, it, was a, it was a broad general conversation of there's a, there's a correct way to do things. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if I brought up Chief or not. I don't want to. Anything more on that point? No, not on that point. Okay. All right, I think I got that. <clears throat> and in the report that I do, I'll make sure that... Include this part that you did not intend to throw the chief under the bus with Adrian on that part. Okay. All right. Um, what's the next piece, Brian? Um, I want to kind of loop back to your conversation with Jarvie. How many times did you and Sergeant Jarvie discuss this incident or this concern that I guess you had? You mentioned the one time in his office. Was there other times? Like up to this point? Yeah. Or sure. It's come up again, yeah. So that, that happened. Thanks. That happened when it happened, and then to my to my recollection, it didn't come up for a long time again until I was given a heads up, hey, this investigation's happening. So just your initial meeting with him in the office, and then nothing for a considerable considerable amount of time until you heard that, okay, yeah, something's gonna come of this. Right, I mean, I think it was July when Chief went on leave, wasn't it, or late June or July? Somewhere, somewhere about that. So there was not, no more conversation, just that one time you didn't have any other conversations at the office, out on the street, during a break, anything like that? Not that I remember, no, because okay. I remember when it came back up, I had almost kind of, like, I thought that was dead in the water and because of the time between when I initially <clears throat> talked to him. Excuse me, when he was giving me the heads up, hey, this is happening. Even after McTaggart expressed his concerns, the department dragged his feet so long that he thought the incident would be ignored. Okay. Um, so I, I don't believe there was any more conversation about it. Okay, so you kind of thought that the, the whole thing had just kind of gone away and it was kind of a surprise when it kind of come back around? Mm -hmm. Okay. So <clears throat> when you sat with Sergeant Jarvie in his office, <clears throat> shared your concern because this is what... then what was your understanding of what was going to happen from there? There was no expectation of anything else to happen. Okay. So my, you didn't my say, understanding well, I'll of my go and do this or that or anything like that? Um, he definitely gave no statement of this is going to happen next. I, you know, there was also no statement of, you know, nothing's going to happen with this. So I don't know if I'm assuming it was like, okay, thanks. I'll look into it kind of thing. I, I, there was definitely no promise of action. I, I remember that much. So, and on from you, was there any uh, statement as far as like, this has got to be fill in the blank. I don't know what it would be, but. Was there an expectation on your part? No. It's like... No. The, okay. my, Could it be handled a certain way or... No, I, I made it clear from the beginning that I was doing what I felt like I was obligated to do. And that was where that, you know, that's why I was having that conversation. Because mm -hmm. policy said that. And so I was fulfilling policy. Policy said report it to a supervisor. So and I made that clear. This is me reporting it to you. I'm done with it. Okay. So... In the interview with DPS, and I don't have anything against you, I, I, I don't, but there's this one part in the interview with DPS that, that confuses me. So, 
you end up saying, they ask you a few times about your concerns and whether you felt like there was excessive use of force. And you said that you were concerned, but based on your perspective of where you were because you were back and not up right front, you didn't see anything that led up to that choking, however it's characterized. And so it might have been justified. You just didn't see that. You just saw Dave Booth's hand on, Re on Rodriguez's neck. Mm -hmm. I don't know if... I'm not. I remember that. I remember saying okay. that. Yeah. I don't want to get that part wrong. So to me, and, and here's the issue that I have, is that you're, you're trying to say it on both sides, fence it. Say, I was concerned, but really I had no reason to be concerned because I didn't see the full thing of what happened. I, I disagree with that. I think that Help us I, I was making it clear that based on what I saw, from my perspective, I observed excessive force. I was also recognizing that excessive force is not determined by my by my perspective. That's that's what it was. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. I was especially where I that was a criminal investigation. So I'm not going to sit there, you know. Obviously, I'm going to be honest, and I was. This is what I saw, and I explained what I saw, and and so I made that statement to acknowledge that knowing what I saw is this perspective, and. So maybe I'll clarify to you then. I do not believe that there was anything that warranted that. But I also acknowledge that it is a possibility that something could have happened that I didn't see. That's a possibility. So you don't believe, help me understand that, that it warranted that. What's that? What Chief did. What I saw. You don't believe there was anything. Any type of neck hold goes against department policy, so there is nothing the suspect could have done to warrant such treatment. That warranted Booth so I, taking his hand and putting right. it on So, I, so I, didn't, I didn't directly observe anything that warranted it, so I can definitely say that because that's my observations, right? And from where I was, which was close, it was, you know, behind Adrian, but still close, mm -hmm. I, I don't really... You know, there's no way that I, it, it didn't seem likely to me that something would have warranted it. I'm just acknowledging that I didn't, I'm not, you know, all seeing and all knowing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that does help us because now we know clearly that you think that Dave Booth used excessive use of force. Yeah, and if I didn't, it would have just died. At the same time, you're trying to acknowledge the fact that this is one perspective and there could be other perspectives. Right. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk for a minute then about uh, the perspective. So, um, I don't expect you to agree with it. it uh, I, in people's situations like this, I would expect them to do a counter to the whole thing and come up with the reasons why it's not that. But the bottom line is, is that for both the, the criminal and the, the administrative review, there is no excessive use of force. Rigby tells McTaggart that his perception is wrong and comes across as angry that McTaggart would make this accusation. His attitude is discouraging and indicates that it is not safe for an officer to address questionable behavior. And so your perception is wrong. And so you'll just have to figure out how best to go about that from here on out. Um, I could go into more detail about why that is. Um, I don't want to kind of 
belabor the point when the main thing is you knowing that that's just not. You and anyone else that thinks that that's how it is, that might have been your perspective at the time, but it's been found to be false. So there was no excessive use of force. Um, so I don't know if it helps you at this point in time to have me explain why that? Sure. Okay. So the overall thing, and you'd have to go through policy, so um, I could sum here, but I don't want to take all your time. You only have two hours. If you want me to go through policy, I will. But the bottom line is, is that in policy there is uh, there's formal complaints and there's informal complaints. Also, when it comes to, and, and each one, you're supposed to follow a certain way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And so when you're coming to your sergeant um, and doing a formal complaint, there's certain things that are supposed to happen. So it says in policy that you're supposed to come immediately. And so uh, I, I don't know that, that you coming within a few days is immediate. But I think it's pretty close. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, I, I was going to say, is enough time to... for me to read the policy and figure out sure. what I'm supposed to do and then yeah, do it I think considered so. immediately? Yes. I mean, I felt like I was... Doing the best you can. Yeah. Um, so that's one issue. Uh, it's got to be written. So you've got to do a, a written statement on what your concern is. So I guess let me ask this. That's, that's obviously in a separate policy. From what? For the the process to file a complaint, right? Is that the policy that you're... Separate from use of force in two different places, you mean? Well, because the policy that I came across was... The policy that I was doing what I was doing, and you hopefully you have it, you probably have it, is... So there's use of force. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was doing right there, is that orange paragraph. That's what I was doing. It says report. So I wasn't filing a formal complaint on chief. That's not what I was doing. I was satisfying that that highlighted part okay. right there. And that's I didn't even read the formal complaint policy because that's not okay. what I was doing. Okay. Well, and we're not here trying to point fingers on, oh, well, you're supposed to look at this one mm -hmm. also. But the bottom line is, is, I mean, all policy is together whether right. you know yeah. about it or not. And so, yeah, you'd want to go to the to the complaint piece. Most of the policy is focusing on when citizens want to make a complaint mm -hmm. on an officer. Um, but there are parts in there that help someone in your situation know how to go about this. And so um, now I don't feel like we're here trying to make a, a, a deal of that. You just need to know that there's um, an immediate uh, requirement and that there's a documentation requirement, and anything that uh, evidence-wise that exists to take it and to to do what you can. I know in this situation that there's questions having to do with the video and whether it's accessible or not. Mm -hmm. So we're not here trying to get in the middle of that stuff. Um, but overall, that is what you're trying to do. You're not trying to be as, as, a, as an officer or as an FTO officer or as a sergeant, you're not trying to um, do an investigation that so-and-so just brought you, then pass it on. So you're informing the proper supervisors. You're finding out what they want to have happen. Mm -hmm. And from there, um, then they get the right people involved that they want to have involved. Yeah. So just don't want anyone thinking. And again, this is something that you can take to the bank. It's not just what I think or how we run things here in the sheriff's office or something like that. I'm speaking for the police department when I say that um, when, when there is a, a concern that someone raises or a complaint, you can use them interchangeably, that someone raises it immediately needs to go to the proper supervisor. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be documented. So citizens sometimes don't want to document. They think that they can be anonymous. Officers don't get to be anonymous. So 
there is more gaslighting, as Rigby implies that McTaggart didn't follow the correct procedure. They work for an employer. If they have a concern about how something was done, then they have a duty to report it. Mm -hmm. And part of that duty is to document it. Mm -hmm. So they've got to do it. It's just part of the rules. Okay. Um, okay. More on the excessive use of force piece. Um, so in this situation, it's not what Dave Booth did is not even use of force. Now, people might disagree with that. But in policy, it's saying here, the application of physical technique or tactic. So it's like, okay, so um, what did Dave do? I think that what's an issue is with his right hand. He took it and put it on Rodriguez's neck and squeezed. I don't know if there's a dispute on what that technique or tactic is. Okay. Uh, technique or tactic. So were we taught to do that somehow in any of our trainings? Grab someone by the throat and do that kind of a thing? So the application of physical technique or tactic, chemical agent or a weapon to another person. It's not a use of force when a person allows himself or herself to be searched, escorted, or handcuffed. So by the definition, if you're not taught the technique or tactic, it's not a use of force. Okay. Now, there can be some disagreement on whether that policy is right or not, or whether it ought to include so, some more things. Okay, so, I mean, the statement you just made, if I punch somebody in the throat, but I've never been taught to do that, then that's not a use of force. Is that... So in your training, maybe I'm misunderstanding you because that your statement your trainings, sounds ridiculous to me. In your trainings, you've never been taught to punch someone. Not in the throat, no. Like, are you? I mean, we've been taught to grab people, so but we've never been taught to grab people by the throat. So I mean, it's it's what it. Yeah, right. How specific that's are you going to be? That's my on point: it, but, is that you've never been taught to grab someone by the throat. So you have to take. We've been more. taught specifically to not grab people by the throat. No, I disagree. You've been taught to not do a chokehold. Okay. And then when it comes down to what a chokehold is, it comes down to blood flow or airflow. So then what you end up looking at is whether. Rigby tries to convince McTaggart that he misunderstood the training. By now, McTaggart has realized that Rigby is not taking this investigation seriously. Uh, the circumstances that surround that, that, that issue. So a chokehold is more one of these things. Yeah. Well, I, and I don't want it to appear that I'm trying to argue to the point that I think Chief is guilty of something. Because I, I did not ever want to be in this situation in the first place, and I'm not the one trying to say he needs to whatever. Like, it, I don't like this situation. I don't no, like no, that I'm in it. It's crappy. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I thought a lot about it, and I made a very informed decision, and I'm a very experienced officer, and I read case law, and I read lawsuits, and I know what is appropriate use of force, or my perspective of what appropriate use of force is. Obviously, I'm not the one who determines it, and it was determined that it wasn't. And I understand all of that. Mm -hmm. But what you're, you know, what you're saying is not changing my perspective of what I saw. Nothing's going to change that. That's sure. why. That's why we're here, right? Yeah. Well, because Lucas, it really comes down to the future, your future in the police department. Sure. So you can dig in your heels and say, and that's not what I'm doing. This is how I feel, and no one's going to change. And okay, that's your decision. You just won't get any trusted positions having to do with DT and use of force and sergeant and sure. those kinds of things because you're not willing to learn and be open minded to it. Sure. So I'm just trying to help you understand that Lexapol and the attorneys that wrote it, mm -hmm. the prosecutors that reviewed the criminal case, 
and fit it within the statute and how it fits into the policy. And then us going through this as well. Everyone, everyone saying what happened there is not a use of force. And so the reason is, is because of the circumstances that surround it all. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's not a technique or tactic, but that's only one part. Mm -hmm. The other piece has, the other pieces have to do with, it was incidental. So I don't know if anyone had a chance, I'll just speak with, about you specifically. You didn't look at the, at the camera pieces. I'm not saying that you needed to, but when you look at the, the recordings of what happened, and you go frame by frame. You have Jesse James Rodriguez, who um, actually sits down in the vehicle. He, they're moving him. He's going back and forth at points. He is compliant. He's not. He wants to go a different direction. Um, there's it's gradient mm -hmm. level of compliance. It's not like you're all 100% compliant or 100% not compliant. Right. It's this kind of level of, mm -hmm. of how that works. So. Point is, Jesse James Rodriguez goes and sits in the vehicle. They get him in the vehicle. Now he decides he wants to come out. So now he's being some level of non-compliant. Mm -hmm. So he's coming out. He's leading with his head. And he and Dave Booth are now like this. Mm -hmm. And whether he, he... He doesn't make statements about kissing him until later. But at this point in time, he's known to be a spitter. Mm -hmm. Dave Booth is wondering whether he's going to bite him. Dave Booth takes him and, and pushes him, and it hits him higher, somewhere in through here, okay. and pushes him back in, mm -hmm. separating space. And then from there, Rodriguez comes out again. Mm -hmm. And that's when Dave Booth's hand catches him here, and, he, and he's pushing him back in. Okay. Now, when I say incidental, this is one frame. You can go frame, frame by frame. Here, his hand isn't there. Here, his hand is there. Here, his hand isn't there. And so you have to figure out the timing of that video. But this is something like one to two seconds. I was going to say, what is the time? So yeah. one to two? Yeah. yeah, it's one to two seconds. And even like I said, my guess was under five. But mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, you said that with DPS. So it's this incidental kind of a thing. Then Jesse James Rodriguez, he's coming back out of the vehicle. A third time. Mm -hmm. And this is when Adrian and others are all now trying to help with the whole situation. And Adrian's grabbing him by the, the feet and they actually get him in there mm -hmm. and the door shuts. Okay. The more Rigby tries to diminish what happened, the more it sounds like he is covering up for his friend Booth. And so when I say incidental, it's like the first time, that's not what Dave Booth was doing. Right. The second time, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And the third time, that's not what was doing either because now it's down lower and... And so none of us knows for sure, does Dave, did Dave intentionally on that go around, grab him by the throat, that's what he was after, and put him in there? Right. But you end up having to look at the overall thing and say, well, he didn't do it the first time and he didn't do it the third time. Mm -hmm. And you also have this, this arrestee and he's in cuffs. Mm -hmm. And that's an important piece to make. Some people are using that to say, therefore, he shouldn't have had his, someone put his hand on his throat. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is he's fighting, he's resisting, and he's continuing to come out and out and out. And Dave Booth is, whether people agree with it or not, the final decision is, is Dave Booth is doing the best he can to get this guy in there. Mm -hmm. And this whole thing was unintended. It was, un, it was unintentional. It was... Uh, it was incidental. Mm -hmm. um, it was inconsequential because he. There's no loss of anything. You don't see anything happening yeah. um, with all of that. So, in the future, is if we can go there for a second. In the future, the issue really comes down to not whether someone's hand was on someone's throat. Um, it has to do with. Uh, was it intentional? Mm -hmm. Was it a tactic? Mm -hmm. Was it a technique that's uh, being used against another? Here, we're not even technically affecting an arrest. I mean, overall, you could say that's what they're doing. 
<laughs> but it, these, they're really not. They already arrested him. Right. What they're doing now is they're escorting or transporting. Mm -hmm. And that's in the policy. And so it's not so much use of force to make an arrest. Although there's an argument that the whole thing from the time you take him from the house to the time you get him to the jail is arrest. I acknowledge that. But policy gets even more specific. And when it starts talking about escorting and transporting, then it's like, hmm, well, it seems like the policy distinguishes between arrest, escort, transport. And, and so the bottom line here, the decision here is it doesn't even rise to the level of use of force um, because it doesn't meet the definition. Maybe it needs to be changed. You were saying you ought to go through that um, if they think that it does. But by circumstances, it also does not. Uh, it's not a technique. It was only incidental. It was only used for one or two seconds. It was only one frame on a, on a video, mm -hmm. things like that. And, and the courts and the attorneys and admin, they want to give cops the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. Because when you're in it with someone, and all of a sudden, my, my forearm hit him in the neck, and now that can, and it could have cut off some airway for some amount of time. And right, right. So it is concerning when you do see an officer's hand on someone's throat and that it's gripped. I'd say that it's like, and man, that, that's And concerning. that was my concern. That's the concern. It's just once you, and it's kind of like pulling a trigger and then it's all second guessed uh, forevermore. So once you actually go through the process and it ends up being, uh, this isn't one. That wouldn't be concerned about it because it's this, but in the end, it's not. Okay. Okay, where do we need to go next? Um, I just want, to mention one thing is I've known you for a long time Lucas and you're very confident and I trust you you know if I have to go into a building I want you on my back and I think it's awesome that you researched you took your time and you researched and you researched but you didn't go that extra step I think if you would want that extra step watch the video I think your mind would be changed on this definitely I really do so maybe in the future Take it one more step. So was that video even mine to watch? Was that my body cam that showed that? Or was it the cage cam in Adrian's car? I, this obviously so, doesn't matter. I'm just curious. So it's not Adrian's because his fell off, right? Right. His body camera fell off. Mm -hmm. Then there would have been one in the, in the vehicle than my camera. And yeah, I'm not talking about the one that's in the vehicle. Okay. So overall, and I, I agree with what Ryan's saying, Another piece you have to read into that, though, another piece of policy you have to read into that, is that there's no requirement to do that work before you go to your supervisor. So when you saw the concerning thing mm -hmm. and it concerned you, it bugged you, that's the time to go and do it. Now, as all of this progresses, right, then... That, that continued work to try to figure out where things are at. Yeah. That helps. Can, can you appreciate that this situation was changed by who it was? If this had been another officer, that probably, and I don't know who it wasn't, but that probably would have been the conversation immediately. It, it made things different because of who it was. It made things very serious immediately in, in my mind. And I'm not And that's why I was... I'm not through with an investigation, so I guess... McTaggart is correct that the investigation is being handled differently since it involves a higher-ranking officer. If anything, both should be held to a higher standard. It's not fair for me to, to answer the question at this point in time, but I appreciate you raising the, the question with it because I think you have a valid point. Sure. I was... 
from the beginning of all of it, I was trying to do the right thing. That's what I always try to do. I don't think anybody can question my integrity in anything I've done in this job, and I stand by that. And I was extra trying to do the right thing because it was my chief. And so what, what I still, the, the reservation or me holding back just a little bit is, is that to some extent, the more you trust someone, the less concerned you are with the issue. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Some people might take what I just said and say, oh, so we should sweep that under the rug. You know, if you feel concerned about it, you should raise it. But to some extent, someone that has a lot of years experience, um, or that's their expertise or blah, 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 you've had a lot of experience with them. Yeah, it's it can be more, I mean, nobody wrote reports on this thing. Um, nobody went to the county attorneys on this thing. So there's just different indicators that's like, well, everyone was focusing on Richard Christ and, and Jesse James Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. That's where the issue real, that's where the use of force was. Right. Because that did involve technique and tactic. Yeah. So, I, anyway, it's a good point. Anything else right now? No. So, here we are. Um, So, one thing that we're going to need from you is a written statement on your feelings about this excessive use of force. So, we're not asking you to agree with us. Mm -hmm. We're asking you to put yourself back in the spot of when this happened. And that that's what we need to do is to document this thing. And so, you had a concern... And when you go and raise it with Jason Jarvey, and then a report being done, hey, on this day or time, or at least the best of your recollection, I went to Jason Jarvey. I spoke to him about these things. My concern is this. We don't want to... Other people can try to make it that it's some other concern. So that's why this matters, is that's what your concern is. It's not any of these other things that people end up using for their own benefit. Um, that's, that's really the issue. It's like, what's your concern? You brought it up to your sergeant. So why did you go to him? Let's get it on paper. Um, some other things to know here. So, um, our instruction to you is to not to talk to anyone, um, about our conversation. Now, if you end up speaking with a spouse, it doesn't matter. Um, but the concern is with other officers. Um, sometimes people want to have an attorney. Okay, I'm not saying you can't speak to an attorney, but I'm saying you're not supposed to go out and speak with friends or the media or, yeah, other officers, whether they're in your agency or not. Um, if you needed to talk with uh, someone because of the stress of all of it. Yeah, you go and you talk. It is an active investigation, and McTaggart knows he isn't allowed to discuss it outside of a few exceptions. Rigby makes it sound more like a warning. That's the professional you talk to. You can talk to doctors, you can talk to attorneys, all of those things. It's just, oh, so I'm going to call a trusted source within law enforcement. No, you're not going to do that. Um, at some point in time, all that's lifted. But at this point, we still have more people to interview, and we don't want the, the information to be shared. Um, I don't know if you feel best about writing this statement on an actual witness statement, or you're going to write it out on a lined piece of paper, or what you're going to do. But either is fine, it doesn't matter. Okay, give me a sec while I go over. Let's 
So, I guess I'm not fully, I mean, my statement's been clear from the beginning. So what, what's, what's happening by me writing it down? So that's what policy requires. For, for what? To document. To document me filing a formal complaint or? To document your concern. We have a recording, right? Mm -hmm. We got the DPS recording. Yeah. The thing about recordings is that people can end up saying that that's, that was a question and then it was, it prompted a response. And so you got the response you wanted because you asked that question. Mm -hmm. And so it's more of a, we're controlling this conversation and you just have to submit to it. It's like, okay, uh, I disagree, but all right. A statement is more, hey, you have a concern, right? You went to Jason Jarvie, you raised a concern. Mm -hmm. So on your own, when you write out what your concern is, now the department knows that that's how you feel. So in your case, it might be exactly the same as what you've, you've stated here. But things have a way of changing over time when attorneys or others get involved. You're not in trouble here, even after some of the stuff that we've talked about and explained. You're not in trouble. You don't need to um, expect disciplinary instruments. Now, when I say that, we are not the decision makers. Right. So we take what we found, we turn it over to the mayor and the manager, and they take it from there. But my feeling is that there's not disciplinaries that ought to be handed down. We went through some explanations, some what you might call counseling or something along those lines, some correction of, eh, no, Lucas, I, we, we disagree with you. It's like this. Mm -hmm. And then if you uh, were vocal, that's all wrong. Uh, they're completely wrong. This is how we're going to go ahead. You want to start training people that way. You want to start talking to people inside your crew. That that's, how, that's when it's going to cause issues. Mm -hmm. The implication that McTaggart could receive disciplinary action if he doesn't agree with the outcome of the investigation is crossing a line. But just because we have a conversation here about, hey, Lucas, this is, that might have been your perception, but just so you know, this is the determination. You're going to have to wrap your mind around it and then from here on out move in that direction, at least if, if you're going to work for Heber. Mm -hmm. That's what it's meant to be. So the written part is just meant to say what you say. We're not telling you what to say. But your concern was so such and such, and you went to Jason Jarvie, so at least that much ought to be in there. But then we're out of it. Mm -hmm. You had a concern. We just want it written. What was your concern? It's what your policy Simple requires. That. And that's what we're doing here is a, is a policy application, a policy review, an IA. So can I, can I ask, like, I, I realize you're telling me that I'm not in trouble, but you're not the one who gets me in trouble. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess what is this? Like, what's, what's the bigger picture of this? Because I felt like I did the right thing and now I'm in way over my head. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that you are. I, I know that that's how you feel. So I'll address I'm it. right here. I mean, <laughs> here we are. Yeah, I'm getting get pulled it. out of trainings for IAs. So yeah, I get it. So overall, yeah, you're in the middle of something that's not comfortable and you don't want to be. Um, at the same time, this is, the, this is one of the most difficult spots to be in in law enforcement because, you know, there's very few other places where you work and they really care about this. And then, and then what happened? And then what happened? And okay, and so we want you to do this and that and it's all recorded and you know, all this kind of, right? For many other employers, except for this industry, that, that really care about that stuff. 
the bottom line is, is um, you're just going to have to trust. Maybe that's difficult to do, but that is what it comes down to. You're just going to have to trust that when we're saying, hey, policy requires this, you can go and look in policy and double check. But we're not asking you to do something that's not in policy. Sure. Well, I, I mean, I guess my question, am I the subject of this IA? No. Okay. So somebody else, obviously an IA is on a person. I mean, that's... They can, right, you know, they can all start and it can be a generalized thing. Right. But I'm also not trying to And obviously you're not going to tell me more information than that, but okay. I, so I'm not, I'm not the subject of this. And IA. I'm not trying to pass this off as though this is just an IA and it could be anybody, anything. It, it is not generalized that way. No, 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 no. But no, you're not a subject. Okay. Yeah. The only way uh, that you can get in trouble here is if you don't do what we ask you to do. So if we ask you a question and you don't want to give the answer, well, that hasn't happened here. That's going to cause you issues. Yeah. We ask a question, you give an answer, we find out different that that's not how it was, that's going to cause you issues. I don't think that's happened yeah. here. And I'm, I like to understand things, so I'm asking questions. I'm not trying to dig my that's good. anything. So. Yep. That's a good thing. Yep, it really is. And then when it comes to any of these other follow-up things that we need, it's like, yeah. The speaking and not speaking to people, um, doing a uh, statement or a report on the issue. Yeah, those are the follow-up things that we need. Do you need a statement right now, or you want me to do that? It's going to be a nice time, and do you think? Well, you've got a half hour before you leave. How long do you think it's going to take you to fill out a statement on this? Not a half hour. Not a half hour? Then let's just get it done and over with. Let's do it now, if that's okay, okay with you. Yeah, and to be clear, you want my written statement to be what my specific concern was that I brought forward to my supervisor. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, put in the circumstances around there. I mean, but yeah. Simple as that. It is a relief to McTaggart that the uncomfortable interview is over, although he may choose to consider his words carefully when he writes his statement. I get a county statement. Well, I mean, if you want to do it on a city statement, you can, but I just had that here in the office, so. It's a policy thing. <laughs> statement. I'm just kidding. Statement. Written statement. 2103. I don't remember. I was That's fine. If I can no, remember no, it. You're, you're fine. March 31st, correct? Yes, it was. Yes. Lucas, are you, are you aware of anyone else that's concerned about excessive use of force in this incident? I should say in the police department. Did you ever speak with the mayor? No. Manager? No. Attorney? No. So a couple of things. One. So here's a um, statute on an issue which I think helps you feel more comfortable on some stuff. So an employer may not take adverse action against an employee because the employee communicates in good faith. That's the main piece there. A violation of suspected or suspected violation of law. So you've done that and it's in good faith. How do we know that? An employee is presumed to have communicated in good faith if the employee gives written notice. Person, oh, to a person in authority over the person alleged. So, and then there's this piece of, an employer may not take adverse action against an employee because an employee participates or gives information in an investigation. So by doing that piece and also by 
consenting to the interview as well, which I know it's required, but you get the good faith um, presumption. I think that's a great thing here. Yep. It shows everyone that you're just trying to do the best you can. You don't have anything against anyone. You're you're researching things. You're you're conscientious. You're wanting to help train employees. That's all you were doing. Um, and we and I think we can say the same thing now. I don't feel any. I don't different. see a change. Not at all. Um, so, this is uh, the Utah Protection of Public Employees Act. So, separate from policy, state law keeps uh, police department, Heber City themselves, or any supervisor or administrator from trying to somehow retaliate or treat you different. And so I'll make sure that in the report, um, I will come back to you if I'm concerned about something. But at this point, you can expect that in the report, it's like you came in good faith. This, you cooperated through the whole thing. It's not comfortable and everyone hates it. Right. And we do too. And let's try to move on. Um, that's one thing. The other thing having to do with the definition on force, application of physical technique or tactic. Mentioned some other things about chemical agents or weapons, but the use on another person, so those ones just don't apply. Okay, so what if? What if there ends up being uh, uh, a punch to the face? And then someone's trying to see if that is a tactic or not. Or let's say they're kicking someone, or they've tackled someone, or whatever other kind of action. Even though the interview is over, Rigby cannot restrain himself once again from insinuating that McTaggart did not perceive the situation correctly. An officer could take on someone else. And maybe we never actually got it covered there. So the overall thing is that's when the state statute would come into place. So is it an assault? Is it a threat? Is it some kind of a, yeah, some, one of those intimidation things? So state statute would apply at that point in time. So that's why in this situation, the criminal part needed to happen. Because uh, it, doing this on someone's neck for maybe two seconds, one to two seconds is doesn't fit within that, given that it's in this fight situation, escorting, transporting, but it does fit within the assault statute or some other piece of the statute. And so if someone had done wrong, it would still be caught there. Right. And that is still um, covered under what you were doing here. And so I, I would say that if that's how you felt, and we know that that's how it is, don't think you did anything wrong by sharing your concern. Not at all. Good thing to do. And I think that by saying that you're open to, uh, there might have been other things going on. It's just I didn't see those things. I just saw this and the concern. Good. And just remember, policy requires immediate. Think that you're probably there. Um, and then you go to your supervisor. If that supervisor's affected, then you go to the next supervisor. Right. We just can't have it be that it's like, oh, well, everyone in here can't be trusted. And so I'm just going to sit on it. And months and months are going to go by. Mm -hmm. more. So you can always go to, it, it lists other people in here. You go to the, the Attorney General's office. You go to the law, law enforcement agency that has jurisdiction. You can go to, uh, it, it names all the places that you can go. You can go to the manager, the mayor. In this case, there's no policy that says, 
whether it's supposed to be the manager or the mayor. But the statute says that it's it's supposed to be the supervisor of the agency head or whoever is affected mm -hmm. by the whole thing. So you don't get it all in one place. I'm sorry. Okay. I think you did well. Thank you. Okay. Okay. May I shake your hand? Absolutely. Thank you. Sorry to take you from training. Sorry for the stress. It's not intentional. Thank you. That was the fun part. I mean the training. Yeah. <laughs> the training. Are we done? Can I yeah, no, 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 you're good. No, it's the training. The fun part is, yeah, is, is going to go down to the hospital. Can I get back upstairs without? Yeah. Thank I'll, you. I'll take you. I'll talk to them. Yeah. Thank you. After his interview with Rigby, McTaggart searched for a new job. He left Heber City PD and started working for a federal law enforcement agency. Two other officers also left the department and accused the city of retaliation. The case was settled for $7,800. Jared Rigby was up for a position that would have made him responsible for the training and certification of the approximately 9,000 officers, deputies, and troopers across Utah. After attention was drawn to this video, his placement was denied. Thank you for watching. Check out my Patreon link in the description below and drop a like on this video. Also, don't forget to leave a comment. I'm always curious to read what you thought of the case.